yeah, I, I really just, I, I just started that. It wasn't, you know, I didn't have to, we didn't have to start all over again or anything five times. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Matos, and this is the Graphically Christian Podcast. Um, actually, no, it's not. It's the Content Aware Podcast. Sponsored by graphicallychristian.com. Great art by Christians for everyone. I nailed it. Yeah, finally, you got that part, the first right? Time. You just screwed up everything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing my my wonderful and encouraging guest, Matt Snipes. Hello. All right. Well, uh, as we usually do, we're going to start off with the State of the Union, which is going to be brief because Sentient Salad Bar, my comic that's on graphicallychristian.com, is on vacation right now. But there could be exciting developments on the horizon, or Ooh. maybe not, but... You know, or depends. Not. Yeah. Won't talk about it now. Keep your ear to um, the ground. Yes, and also keep your ear to the ground on uh, antiviral, a a magnum opus, opus being magnum opus. Wow. Being definitely not overselling this one. Well, okay. It's hand, so since it's you brought it up, crafted by the. I'm not gonna. Okay, you, you go ahead. Well, I mean, we we actually didn't just we didn't talk about it at all last time. Um, which is, I don't know. I was kind of a little bit happy about because I didn't make a whole, I haven't, I didn't make a whole lot of progress on it at that point. But, uh, as of right now, I am progressing through the first arc and I'm on page four of the artwork, which I'm hoping to finish the basic pencils of that tonight and then finish page five, page five tomorrow, ink, both pay ink page three, four and five. And if I have any more time, finish the final revision of the script, which would be the third draft of the script. And then, <laughs> once all that is done, I'm hoping on Saturday uh, that I can get some scans or something and start coloring. So, a little stage, a little peek behind the the development curtain for mm-hmm. <laughs> antiviral. So I'm um, hoping that you you should see some previews, like some little like. Uh, I don't know what you would call them. Um, little hints, little teaser images. Yeah, little teasers. There you go, of uh, some stuff that's going to be nearly done sometime next week. You should start to see like some, you know, little bits and pieces of certain panels or pages that are going to be fully done and colored sometime next week, and then hopefully by the end of next week we'll be ready to post it. I get, we got me and John got to get together and talk about. The scheduling um, for that once it's actually ready to be released. So there you go. More is coming. Yeah. It's currently being worked on. I'm actually sitting in front of some artwork pages right now that I'm going to get to work on as soon as I'm done recording this. And yeah, yes. exceed, you'll be able to get some little get some little tidbits this week. And maybe by the end of the week, who knows? Maybe once once we figure out the schedule, it'll actually be up by the end of this week. Sleep in fear. Sleep in fear. <laughs> I don't know All if right, I would so make, if I speaking would of fear, mm-hmm. today's topic is the satanic panic, which the audience may or may not know about. Um, I did a little bit of research a uh, few, I, I guess maybe a year ago now, um, because I was watching a documentary that uh, this reviewer online called The Cinema Snob, um, he was watching a video about, uh, he has a series called DVD-R Hell, where he reviews, like, DVDs that he finds, presumably in, like, the bargain basement of, like, a dollar store. Yeah. Um, and it this one was, like, this guy, this pastor, presumably this, like, celebrity pastor, who Past- was... Yeah, pastor in air quotes, we should probably yeah, say. Like, personality, maybe a, a televangelist would be more um, appropriate. Uh in the late 80s, early 90s, that was talking about this premonition he had because he walked into his toy store and all of a sudden he was, he says that God made him aware that things like Master of the Universe and um, Scooby-Doo and all these cartoons, he started seeing this imagery in them that was satanic to him. And he thought that kids were being manipulated um, by this imagery and that's uh, kind of like typifies what this was. There was a lot of like DVD series and um, I guess just some 
like grassroots um, yeah. stuff happening in churches where you know pastors started seeing kids shows or video games um, as satanic because there was I mean every now and again you'll see a bad guy that is you know he has like a skull mask or he has horns and you know uh, it was seen as a lot more um, it, like ill intentioned like that the creator was a Satanist or something, and he was trying to seduce the innocent uh, children that or are watching I the think program. Part of the other, the other, the other side of it was that these things could like influence children supernaturally to that effect. Okay, like these, like this, these pieces of media had a supernatural nature to kind of turn the soul, as it were. Maybe, oh, not, okay. maybe not quite that, you know, like quite that blunt in terms of like how right. I don't think anyone would ever phrase it that way, but well, it, they viewed, they were viewed as like a corrupting influence. I think is let's quite. get into some early examples because that, that interests me because I'm, I'm more aware of things like, um, like thinking that the, uh, like for example, with Harry Potter, I think that's the, the one I'm most familiar with. Um, because I wasn't really raised in the in the era of the dawn of things like Dungeons and Dragons or uh, Magic the Gathering. Um, mostly what I would see is that parents would see that their kids were getting into Harry Potter books, that, like, you know, when these things just got popular, a lot of Christian families thought, well, my kid is going to read this, and he's going to think that um, witches are good, and that witchcraft is something to aspire to. And it was more of like a, like a pathos thing. Like they're going to, they're going to sympathize with a witch character and actually start like thinking that that's a good thing to get into. But what you're talking about, I think is more like with, uh, if you're talking about like cartoons, like Scooby-Doo and He-Man and things that like, there would be imagery in, the thing that would like kind of like hypnotize or like well i don't know, know if it was like influence a sub, yeah it was like a subliminal thing but it was more uh-huh. along the lines that and, and this goes into more like like uh pokemon was not a big thing about this was that you know pokemon meant pocket monsters and pocket and pocket monsters that sounds evil and things like that so even things that don't necessarily mention uh, witchcraft or the occult or wizards or sorcerers or magic in any way, even if they don't directly mention it, if they're still somehow related on some level, if there's some subject matter that's still tied to it, like monsters in Pokemon, which Pokemon was, is basically pet battler. I mean, the, the, monster, the, the quote unquote monsters or Pokemon really just giant animals, or giant pets that people collected. And battled against each other. I mean, it's it's basically like dog. It's, it's dog fighter the series, pretty much. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's not... more like like I, I get what you're saying, but like dog fighter would still have bad connotations. But oh, like yeah. it's like puppy. It's like puppy fighter. Yeah. Like if that's, and I think the cartoon environment is worse. something that okay. is. Um, I think from like the 50s and 60s was always kind of like a. Uh, I don't know why, but it was kind of like thinking like you'd let your kid watch Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck shoot each other in the face, um, but for some reason, for some reason in the in the late eighties, early nineties, when these shows were starting and getting popular and stuff, for some reason it was it caught on then that if it was like a pocket monster, then it, it was demonic, and I guess you can think like. You know, there's a history of, uh, you know, demons in the Bible, and they're something that that uh, would possess a person. So I guess you could take that leap. But the fact that, I mean, I would think that if, if you see it at all, that you would understand this is a cartoon character. Um, but we're we're getting ahead of ourselves. I, I think that it's important to cover um, magic and Dungeons and Dragons. Now with magic, uh, I know the thing about that that. I think Peek's parents' interest is that you're basically uh, now correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the mythos part of it that you're you're basically calling something in order to help you win? 
And so, like, having the cards, it's kind of standing in for the fact that you're using characters in order to fight for you. Is that what that's like? Okay. So, for those who don't understand how um, kind of games, kind of like fantasy games in general work, there are two things that I want to differentiate very early on and very clearly. There, there's one thing called the mechanics of a game, and there's another thing which is often referred to as the lore of a game. Now, the lore can mean anything from the story, the history, the background. It means all of that combined. I mean, you know, the history, the mythos, the background, the story, the characters. That's the lore. It's commonly referred to as the lore in gaming culture or just in fantasy works in general. So, Magic the Gathering is officially... And the way it is played it is a collectible card game. It means that you can, there is a set number of cards released, usually one set released every year or so. And there is a certain amount of cards that are common, and there are a certain amount that are uncommon, some that are rare, and then some that are called mythic, which means they're very rare. And some people play simply for the collection. They like the artwork that's on the cards. They collect them, and they want to get those rares and mythics because they want to have a valuable collection, or at least a collection that they really like. But you have on Magic, though, you have a lot of people who actually play the game. So it's a card game. It's a strategy card game. And in this card game, you play these creatures, or you play these spells and instants and um, land, which is kind of gives you that what gives you the power inside of the card game to play these creatures and things like that. So it's a strategy game. You've got to put down resources to call in, you know, support, basically. Whether that be in soldiers or monsters or spells or just abilities. These things, like, certain cards and things are called sorcerers and spells, but really they could be just about anything. Like, some cards can just be like, you know, it could be a spell card, but that spell card is called ambush. It's meant to symbolize an ambush in the match that you're playing against the player and that card can cause maybe the other player to lose one of their cards or something so mechanically that's what it is it's a collectible card game it's a strategy card game in which you pit yourself against an opponent where you both have to start with a certain amount of points and you have to take those those pers- that person's points down to zero in order to win you can do that by attacking them with your soldiers creatures or spells or um, abilities or whatever. Now, the as far as the lore goes, the story, the fantasy story behind Magic, because collectible card games kind of have to have a story and a lore behind them to um, kind of keep them cohesive, to kind of make them make sense in, in a certain way. So the lore behind Magic is that it's a fiction in which the multiverse exists now the multiverse is something hotly debated in science and religion today as whether or not it can exist i have no kind of scientific knowledge on it whatsoever to actually be like i have yay or nay on the issue but in the multi in magic's lore there is the multiverse and the multi there are all these different dimensions with all these different civilizations some of them are magic based other ones are like just more reminiscent of ancient civilizations like the Greeks and stuff like that. And in these, in the lore of the game, you, the player, uh, are supposed to be a, what's called a planeswalker. Now a planeswalker is basically like a trans dimensional magician of some kind or a mage. And you're supposed to be able to go from plane. They call it, each dimension. They call planes, which is why you're called a planeswalker. So you go from plane to plane, um, battling supposedly and collecting creatures and soldiers and abilities and spells. And so when you come across another planeswalker, you can duel them, quote unquote. And then that's when you call in your uh, monsters lands abilities spells soldiers etc that's what the cards symbolize in the game in the the lore of the game the cards are supposed to symbolize the creatures and abilities and whatever that you're summoning that you're using to defeat this other planeswalker in a duel 
So you're trying to beat the person you're playing one-on-one. You're trying to beat your opponent, whoever it is in real life. And in the lore of the game, you're both planeswalkers attacking each other with these different creatures and things you've gathered on your travels across the different planes, basically. Um, so I think that is where kind of a lot of the whole satanic panic thing came from. I mean, obviously magic was an easy target because the name of the game is magic and you supposedly play this mage. But from all the people who I know who play the game and from all the people that I've watched online on YouTube and seen people write about it, I don't think many people sit there and play a game magically. Yes, I'm a planeswalker. I'm going to attack you with these creatures I've gathered throughout my travels right. across all these wonderful dimensions. <laughs> I'm so engrossed in who I am. It's like, yeah, the, the no. emphasis so like, is on I, I have this deck that it's I feel not, like these cards that I've not on And I think it's pretty strong like because losing yourself you know, in the... I put these uh, certain types of creatures and spells and in there that I, are designed to th- help me the win thing effectively. That, um, and I want to see how good and I my deck stands about up against yours. A so let's play the strategy game. Um, and it's something that uh, we oh, definitely yeah, have different between us, is that uh, you, since you're a gamer, you get into a game not necessarily for the story, but because no. you enjoy playing the game. And it's, a, it's having a strategic mindset about something as opposed to like you're mm. you're sympathetic to the character, and you're thinking that like, oh, wouldn't it be great to be a planeswalker? It's more like, let me use the mind, the logical mind that I have to get into this thing. Um, right. And uh, as I go on into like how we both experienced it, I think growing up, um, what I always hated about the satanic panic and the instances I would come into uh, conflict with it. Um, I, I, I really loved stories growing up. I really loved fantasy and, um, just fiction in general. Um, and I thought, I thought of it as, uh, a companion to my faith because of being introduced to people like Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, who, uh, were both Christians themselves. Um, and so it was weird to me to see people that were labeling it as demonic or, as like insidious when I mean it's hard enough as a Christian to have the type of belief compared to non believers where you're believing in uh, an invisible God and an invisible place that you go or a place that we haven't seen. Um and so getting into fantasy stories it was almost like uh, you know, I, I'm able to um see all these like non believers, believers alike talk about reality in another way using fantasy worlds to talk about like the cosmology of our world um and so it was really great to get involved in those stories see how c.s lewis you know created his allegory and things like that um and then things like harry potter came out which is that was the the one that i I had ran into ran into growing up and I know, like, in our in our elementary school, there were a lot of people getting into it. And I think, I, I don't know this for certain, but I know my parents saw resistance for that. And they actually came to me and said, or I, know, I remember a conversation where they said, we don't care if you read this. We're aware that it's not like that. Um, and I, I don't know if I asked them or not or whatever, but... I think it was, um, I was glad for them, and uh, just in general, they've really been supportive of, you know, they they take me to the movies um, nearly every weekend and stuff, so they were supportive of that, um, but then there were friends I would have, and I'm not going to mention names, um, but like that weren't allowed to see Lion King growing up, because the circle of life was kind of seen as a, like a Buddhist kind of principle. Um, but like that, that was the number one thing I was, I would kind of like be weirded out by because I'm thinking like these kids are not at the level, at the abstract thinking level to understand, you know, these complex issues that you think are hidden in this series or in this movie. 
Um, so I, I, I didn't get that at all. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't say I ran into much of it other than Harry Potter and with things like, you know, like the Lion King there, where it was like a, you know, thought of as like Buddhist. Um, but you, you can explain how you, uh, what, what experiences did you have with I don't, really know. I don't know if I've it, had like any direct experiences. I mean, obviously we both grew up in church and when, when certain things happened, like the whole Harry Potter thing, and then I think there was a little bit of a resurgence when Pokemon became super popular. Um, I think there was kind of like this kind of overall thing happening in like the Christian circles in churches, especially in America. And I remember hearing stuff about it on like stuff like on TV, like the 700 club type stuff. But at the same time, they, they, they kind of rely on that shock jockey type thing. Sometimes we just talk about some things sometimes just to get better ratings. I feel like, but I don't really remember. I remember like a few comments being made here and there. I don't remember who made them or anything, but just like people occasionally bringing up, you know, Pokemon being pocket monsters or Harry Potter involving sorcery or, you know, whatever. I remember that occasionally hearing about that, um, growing up in church, but I don't remember everyone. I don't remember having any specific experience of being like anyone telling me that, that, you know, this is, bad or satanic or that this is fine and good or whatever like i don't think i ever had anyone just come and tell me that straight up or just try to talk to me about it straight up when i was a kid or a teenager growing up i do remember one conversation i think i had with my mom which when i got i got into i got into star wars like really heavy at a really young age i got like the first big encounter with like sci-fi stuff that i had and like that was kind of like my first love as far as like nerd related stuff and i got really into it i watched all the movies this is just this is before the prequels came out and there's only the original movies and the games and the books and so i watched all the original three movies like at least three times each probably more than that and i had uh i had played some of the games and i had started buying like the uh the um jedi padawan series if anybody remembers that like right after the first prequel came out i think they started coming out with the jedi padawan series which was like for like younger readers so i started getting those and started reading those and i remember my mom being a little concerned because i was so into it and i think she had heard something like on the radio or on t on some christian channel on tv about how star wars kind of has like this eastern mytho- eastern like philosophy type religion stuff to it because like it talks about the force and everything is the force and the force is everything blah blah blah, blah. and like that i think he's kind of concerned that i'll be influenced by that in some way i mean i obviously i obviously didn't end up didn't really have any sort of impact on me i mean the i, I was just into star wars because of the cool lightsaber fights and the space battles and stuff like that and that's pretty much the beginning and the end of it for me at that age. And of course, it didn't even last that long because a few short years after that, I discovered Lord of the Rings and that was it for like the rest <laughs> yeah, of my I teenage ask years. You, uh, whether anything came up about that uh, in your household. Not that, um, uh, not that I remember you mentioning that. It's just like I know that you read even more than I did into Lord of the Rings. So I thought there might be... Uh, I was just curious as to how your family or anybody that you knew um, in our church kind of reacted to you being that deep into Lord of the Rings. Well, I mean, the Lord of the Rings thing was different because um, Tolkien had the connection to C.S. Lewis. They were like best friends or whatever. And there was always like that kind of discussion that, and no one really knew where Tolkien kind of landed um, biblically and doctrinally. Like everyone knows like C.S. Lewis's work at least the line in which the wardrobe was like intended to be really allegorical, if not completely allegorical. And he had written, he had written several books and everyone knew that he was like a reformed even He was like a, what's the word? He's like an evangelical, but he was also, um, crap. What's the word for, uh, like Calvinists and stuff like that. Reformed theology or something like that. Anyway, okay. everyone everyone knew, you know, everyone knew that like Lewis's stuff was solid and everything like that, biblically. And 
um, critically. And I think because of Tolkien's association with Lewis and his own somewhat Christian background, as a Lord of the Rings, while not an allegory, it does have a lot of symbolism in him. Like it does have like symbolism for like the Christ character and and for sin and for good and evil and stuff like that. So I think I Lord of the Rings kind of got like a free pass, even though it kind of has like wizards and stuff in it, quote unquote. And I mean, if you read into like the extended universe and stuff like that and Middle Earth and whatnot, it definitely does have sorcerers in it, but they're always they're always bad. Um, there are no good sorcerers, and there's only like two or three good wizards, and then one of them goes bad. There really is five, but two of them you never hear anything about. But the um, so like I feel like I got a, like Lord of the Rings kind of got a free pass um, from everyone that I knew in our church, and no one no one ever said anything to me about it. If not, it was more the opposite. People whenever they had questions about Lord of the Rings, I remember a couple people always at um not always but asking me stuff like when the movies came out or they had just read one of the books they would always come up and ask me questions about this or that or what they should read or what, what i thought about it because i've i think i've read the original trilogy i've read all three books multiple times um and i started getting into the history of middle earth series which is like all tolkien's collected works that he kind of never published but his son collected them and put a lot of them out and so I started reading all the history of Middle Earth books and basically everything I could get my hands on that was like Lord of the Rings related. Um, but yeah, like that, Lord of the Rings kind of was never really an issue as far mm. as like satanic panic um, kind of stuff, right. like related stuff. And uh, as we uh, go into like the, like how is it needed or like when is it not needed, I would say that like what the the root of the problem is ignorance and unawareness of what the actual content is. Um, and so I feel like that's where our church kind of shines. And like, I appreciate that about our church was that um, if people that were not, you know, our parents and even like if there are pastors and stuff, if they are aware that we're into something, they would kind of leave it to our parents to, you know, deal with something like there, there was never any like, uh, Oh, you're into this. Let me take you aside and berate you about this. Um, and even when it came to, I think both of our parents, it was always just like, I'm concerned because I don't know what this thing is. Why don't you explain it to me? And then they would be aware that this is not what the, if there was like some kind of pastor that was part of the, satanic panic movement that was like calling attention to it they would be aware that you know uh this there might be symbolism involved in this thing but uh i think for the most part it was just kind of like you know what are you listening to what are you watching and what do you like do you think that that's biblical um but i think that should be really the approach that people take because i think those who are who are ignorant of the content and are just putting their uh all their marbles in these pastors who um are just like kind of they they kind of get a cult following after a while because they're seen as like really discerning and really wise for seeing all the symbolism that in reality is not purposeful intent of the author trying to get people involved in demonic or witchcraft things um, they're seen that they're kind of venerated and they kind of gained like a celebrity status, especially back when the satanic panic started. Um, so the, the, I think the, the biblical parent would, um, kind of err on the side of showing their kids, like you can have fun and be like, I, I feel like what parents that follow these, these preachers and, uh, these type of writers who, if they're still writing books about this, um, they're, they're, uh, they're, they are ignorant and they don't really know, um, that what they're more likely doing to their kids is kind of showing them that fun is wrong. Um, that, like, they should, like, kind of step on eggshells. They should act like, you know, every, everybody who is in the world is trying to get them to leave what they believe in. Where in reality, uh, and we were kind of just talking about this, uh, 
because of the um, gay marriage ruling, uh, we were talking about there was an article that uh, geeksindograce.com put out, whereas, like, the way that they were saying to react to it is, these are people who are not Christian, so be aware that judging them is kind of like, you know, uh, judging somebody for not speaking your language, because it's just, it's foreign to them to obey uh, things that they don't understand. So these people are creating characters, mostly bad guys who have, you know, things that are satanic, they, they use all this imagery, but they're not aware of what that means, and they certainly don't believe that any of it's real. So to act like they're trying to, you know, get your kids to believe in something doesn't really make sense because most of the world is not, does not even believe in God. Um, so I think the, the, the way that Christian parents should act is, you know, um, use caution, understand that you should be involved in what your kids are playing and watching and reading. Um, but, but just kind of be aware that some of this alarmism is unnecessary because, um, these people don't actually, for the most part, um, if they are trying to convince your kids to be involved in witchcraft or demonism or anything, it'll probably be plainly aware, like, you'll be aware of it because they'll post that kind of stuff on their Twitter or on their blog, and it'll be a lot more blatant. Um, and then for our last segment, I wanted to just discuss, uh, what are some of the new, uh, iterations of this, like, outcroppings of, of, uh, Satanic Panic. One thing I just thought of was with, uh, Ghost Rider. I feel like there was some, some fear about that, um, and I, I remember, like, uh, no one in particular, but it was kind of, like, a wondering, like, what, what the Ghost Rider is about, and, um, it, it might have just been the fact that, like, the marketing for it wasn't necessarily, um, I mean, it was in that era where they were still trying to figure out what the, the superhero movie was, um, and, I mean, it, I think all the comic fans will probably say that the execution of the character was not, uh, done nearly as well as it could have been, um. I mean, the movies were terrible, let's <laughs> be honest, uh, <laughs> but, I don't know, it's just, Daredevil, I mean, not Daredevil, um, Ghost Rider, I don't know, it's just very difficult. It's a difficult character to defend. I mean, kind of, because I mean, like, if any, if anywhere the satanic panic was justified, it's, I feel like it's definitely a character that is, like, directly involved with demons and a devil. I mean, it's difficult to kind of, like, say that characters like Ghost Rider are completely fine mm -hmm. because... I mean, there's just, there's so much, like, there's just definitely uh, the, you know, satanic issues or demon issues or cult issues that play a very prominent role in books like Ghost Rider. Right. And I mean, right. you can, you can argue the fact that, you know, you know, he, he's not an ally of the devil. He fights against them, but like, he was still resurrected by the devil. I'm pretty sure that's, that's the storyline or he still made a deal with the devil or something. Right, so well, like, like part of his like, powers are, powers he's, are uh, it's a demon, a demon kind of using him, him, as, using him as, like, a vessel, like a vessel, I guess. Right, yeah, and it's very hard to, be, to kind of defend a book like that, where it's just, like, right. the main character is kind of like a half-demon who's at, who's trying to fight against the devil. So, right. yeah, and, he right. kind of is like a hybrid demon. I think that's probably the newest uh, iteration of this in modern society, is that, like, there are since, like, comic book films... And sci-fi fantasy has now become like, you know, we have like these tentpole films based off them. And um, now like there are studios like Blumhouse Films that do like a, a demon possession film like every year. Um, I think the new thing is like there are, uh, and like I remember in our kind of idea in our church and, and I think rightly so that um, demon possession and T taking these kinds of things lightly, and especially, like, I know uh, our youth pastor uh, kind of talked about how in these movies, God is completely absent, and, 
you know, even though um, personally, like, like um, I'm of the opinion in my writing and in and reading and everything, I'm kind of okay with um, like playing around with it somewhat because, um, like, I, I'm more okay with them playing around with hell and the devil and demons just because I don't have any re respect in my heart for those things. Um, it's kind of like a weird thing with me where, like, uh, if I see somebody, like, I, I know apparently in, in Ghost Rider at one point, Jesus was, like, a character. Um, they couldn't call him Jesus, but it was kind of like he was the friend or something. Um, and it was kind of like their way of saying, like, their way of showing Ghost Rider being saved, but in, like, the most PC way possible. Um, but that, to me, is very insulting because I actually believe in him and what they're doing is they're they're make they're kind of like bastardizing something I believe in. Whereas with the hell and the devil and, and demons, like it's okay to play around with that because I don't I don't have any stock in it. Um but on the other hand, if you do show that, you know, and there's people that unlike me are not, you know, um exposed to the Bible on a regular basis, then that's their only exposure to demons and hell and the devil. And it's kind of shown in like this omnipotent way as if, you know, if you experience this in real life, um, which I think is less, <laughs> less often now because I think the devil is probably gaining more ground in convincing people that, you know, there is no spiritual realm at all. But, uh, you know, the, if you, if that's your own, only exposure to it, then that's probably, not good because you're you're convinced in these movies that um god is not there for you and um you know you can be possessed by the devil at the drop of a hat and more often than not the demon wins in the end of the movie um oh so yeah I, I mean i don't know horror movies to me always kind of seem like a strange thing to kind of defend particularly as a christian because they're kind of movies that kind of glorify like gory murder I mean, there's one thing about action movies where the bad guys are getting shot up and there's, that's war and combat, and that's kind of a different topic to kind of explore and discuss as far as where the Bible falls on that. But I think, pretty think, I'm pretty sure like commandments like thou shalt not murder probably wouldn't really shine very uh, well upon like movies where the majority of the cast gets murdered and it's considered to be entertaining. Right. Well, I, I feel like it kind of falls on two sides. Like, you get films where, like, I, Final Destination is always the thing that pops up in my mind, where the point of going to see the movie is that people die in ridiculous ways, and that's supposed to be entertaining. Um, and I think then there are things like the, like the Exorcist or things like that, where there is a, they're trying to scare you in a very unique way, and um, there's also kind of, uh, it's kind of like, um, you can harken back to, like, the times of Beowulf, where um, there is a monster that is, like, demonic, and but it kind of stands for some kind of, like, cultural evil. And what the, what the person writing the film is trying to do is they're trying to make kind of like a mythological type of scare like they're trying to uh do something uh, they're trying to make horror on the level of like uh, a prestige type film um where you know it doesn't it's making this this monster a mythological type of thing rather than um actually like a uh a spiritual thing or uh so it's it's the fact that the spiritual element of it is taken out completely, it, I can't really uh, defend or, um, you know, uh, really, like, get behind because, in reality, the demons versus God thing exists. Like, there is a actual war being held in, in life, and those movies kind of take that lightly. Um, but to think that, like, that they're to kind of say that there is an intent on the author's point to um a 
just make something gory and, you know, disgusting. They're not trying to gross people out. They're just trying to make a scary movie. Uh, and then they're not actually, they don't actually probably believe that this thing exists or they're, you know, they're not actually trying to pay respect to this demonic creature or whatever. Um, it's just, it's kind of like, it's a gray area because like, um, the kind of alarmism that the satanic panic would level against it probably doesn't exist. But then again, like, it's just like any other story. It has to hold up on the merits of the theme that it's tackling. And, um, more and more as like less money is spent on producing horror movies. Um, I feel like the writing and the cinematography and stuff just keep getting worse and it's not, there's really little to defend at all because they're just really poorly produced movies. Um, so then, uh, I think that's it for this edition of the content aware podcast. Um, Thank you for listening. Is there anything you want to add, Matthew? Uh, just shameless self-promotion. Be sure to check in graphicallychristian.com for all content coming updates this week. Hopefully we'll have more stuff AV-related, some preview posts and things. I think I mentioned that at the beginning a little bit. But uh, And keep on lookout for news as far as the graphically christian youtube channel and possible other channels coming down the line maybe sometime in the near future who knows uh take it away john <laughs> bye everybody god bless 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 bless